Hi, this is Sasamaki Mora. So we're now going to continue the history of the world. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about the early modern uh, Southeast Asia. So let me now share a screen. And there we are, early modern Southeast Asia. So um, I can't talk about every single country and I'm going to focus on uh, really just uh, two places primarily, but we will talk about uh, you know, to, I will try and cover the others, you know, briefly as well. But the main places I want to talk about is Thailand and Indonesia, uh, specifically, you know, Indonesia under the Dutch East India Company, and Indonesia, you know, uh, a part of Indonesia, uh, uh, Aceh. Um, and at the end, I also want to talk a little bit about the Philippines. So here we go. Okay, so this is the 17th century map of Southeast Asia. Um, so, you know, people didn't have accurate maps uh, yet, <laughs> but uh, in the 1600s, this is the map that the Europeans had created for themselves. And it's more or less right, right? So from east to west, here is Japan, here is China. Uh, what they would consider the Philippines is here. This is Indonesia with the islands of Borneo, Java, and Sumatra. This would be Southeast Asia. And then this is India and that's Ceylon. And then, so that would be Persia. So they, they cover, you know, Pretty much all this. And, you know, they actually knew about the northern part of Australia as well. So in Southeast Asia, which is basically this region here, which is huge, uh, why we can't do every single country there, uh, you have uh, land-based countries that are in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and Burma. So Thailand back then was known as Siam. So Siamese is another uh, name that you might hear. Uh, and then there are sea-based countries uh, that are in Malacca, which is you know, right on the coast here, on the uh, peninsula here, on the island of Java and on the island of Sumatra. Um, and then uh, I think there were kingdoms in uh, the Philippines, but uh, the history of the Philippines before the arrival of the Spaniards is pretty much lost to us. So there's no way to know. Um, all right, so in this part of the world, uh, the religion to the religions to spread are Mahayana Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, they came in ancient times. I think I talked about this in an earlier video. Uh, and then in the Middle Ages or late Middle Ages, Islam arrives by boat and starts spreading along the islands here or these uh, island-based kingdoms. Uh, and they spread through trade, not through conquest. Um, and then in the late, late Middle Ages or the early modern period, the very beginning of the early modern period, uh, Theravada Buddhism from Sri Lanka, from Ceylon Island here, begins to arrive and they begin to convert people over here. Um, so, you know, the early modern Southeast Asia is actually a very important period in Southeast Asia's history uh, for these uh, religious changes, but it's also important because a lot of the, the politics that happens uh, still reverberate to us today. So it's now, uh, Oh, well, before I talk about the politics, let's, let me now talk about trade. <laughs> so uh, in Southeast Asia, there's this place called the Spice Islands um, that produces uh, three spices that couldn't be made anywhere else in the world. These three spices are cloves, nutmeg, and mace. So on the left is the clove plant. Uh, so this tips here, this is basically what becomes the spice called cloves. And on the right, this is a picture of the nutmeg tree uh, or the nutmeg plant. And that is the fruit and inside the fruit is this seed thing. So on the outside of the seed is these red uh, stringy things. That is the mace. And then the nutmeg itself is the nut inside. So this is the nutmeg and mace, and that's the cloves. Um, and basically everybody around the world wanted to come to Southeast Asia uh, to trade. And in that sense, um, in the early modern period, the center of the world was Southeast Asia. This is the place where Asians, you know, from you know China, Japan, um, you know, uh, East Asians from China and Japan, uh, South Asians from India, uh, West Asians or you know Middle Easterners from Persia and Arabs, um, and Europeans all wanted to come to trade. Uh, you have to remember that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue because he was seeking spices. Right, Columbus was seeking uh, India. Uh, and the Portuguese obviously made it over here as, as well. All right. So uh, if the key export is this, the uh, spices, um, and you know, uh, they, they export other things as well. So for example, I, it's not in here, but 
uh, the Thais, for example, uh, they exported deer skin. Um, it's like hard to imagine, but apparently deers were like really, really plentiful in Southeast Asia, in Thailand at the time, or in Siam at the time. And so one of the things they exported was deer skin. Uh, they also exported rice as well, but we'll skip back. All right. You know, because the climate is warm, you know, uh, they can uh, raise the rice plant uh, twice a year. So they, they have abundance of food there. All right, so what are they importing? So Southeast Asia imports from India cotton cloth. This is the, the key thing that they import. So the cotton cloth that they import from India is called calico. Uh, and it's got these nice big floral prints. Um, and the other thing that they're importing from India are spices. So this is the spice that will be, you know, eventually become black. So this is actually black pepper. Um, and you know, from India, you can get like turmeric, cardamom, ginger, and all these other spices. Um, and you know, it's like you know, these spices don't have to be just made in India. They can be made in other places. So, for example, black pepper would be made in vast quantities by the people of Aceh, and they would make a fortune out of that. Uh, another spice that comes out of you know the South uh, South Asian region would be uh, cinnamon. Cinnamon, uh, true cinnamon, is produced in the island of Ceylon, uh, modern day Sri Lanka. Uh, it's only produced there. Uh, the cinnamon that most people uh, use is actually not the true cinnamon uh, from this uh, part of the world. It's not fake cinnamon, it's cinnamon, but it's a different plant. Uh, it's got a similar taste. Um, but if you actually uh, cook with it or try it, uh, you'll see the difference between like the real cinnamon from Sri Lanka uh, and the other types of uh, cinnamon that's from a different plant. Uh, cinnamon, by the way, is tree bark. so. Uh, the, the real cinnamon is really thin. Uh, just a level of detail I guess most people don't really care about because they don't cook that much. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, but like, you know, when you get like the cinnamon stick to twirl with, you know, like, I look at it, I was like, this ain't real cinnamon because the real cinnamon is really uh, thin. Uh, <clears throat> this is neither here nor there, but a final uh, one, uh, uh, minor point that I would like to add. Uh, things like hot pepper, you know, the, the red spices, uh, cocoa and uh, vanilla. These are all from Mexico. They're not from Southeast Asia. So although Columbus sails the ocean blue looking for you know, black pepper and other kinds of Indian spices, it turns out that he actually found a different set of spices that the uh, Aztecs were using, uh, that the Mayans, the Aztecs uh, would be using. Uh, so you know, I like chocolate, so <laughs> and I like spicy food. So you know, it's like, I'm glad that this happened. I'm glad that I'm living now. <laughs> all right, so trade with China. Uh, in terms of trade with China, the Southeast Asians are importing porcelain and silk, uh, but specifically really raw silk. Uh, porcelain is only made in China, so they have to import it from China. Uh, uh, in the case of, uh, and I think there are attempts to try to like replicate porcelain, but they, they basically fail just like in the Middle East. Um, in case of silk, uh, Southeast Asians actually knew how to make silk. Uh, silk production was known. This probably is due to the fact that as far as I know, one of the early, not the, the place where silk was, uh, I don't know if it's originally, but one of the oldest places in which silk is cultivated is actually along the Yangtze River uh, in, you know, in what would be considered Southern China at the time. It's not part of you know, the Yellow River uh, area of Northern China. Um, and since all these people were pushed out of, you know, uh, southern China into Southeast Asia, they probably brought that along with them. So uh, people in Southeast Asia, you know, knew about silk production way, way back. But if you want really high quality raw silk, uh, you know, the silk threads, if you want, not the silk cloth, but the threads, if you want really high quality raw silk, you still have to get it from China. Ch China still produced the best quality raw silk. Uh, and also at a reasonable price. Uh, Chinese silk was just couldn't be beat in terms of quality and in terms of price. Uh, it was just a really nice uh, uh, point. I mean, I would imagine that other societies could also make really good silk, but then the cost would be too prohibitively expensive and it'd be cheaper to just import it from China. So what's happening here? Um, tea production is also known in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, places like Burma and Vietnam uh, produce tea for a long time. Uh, this is also partly because the tea, you know, uh, becomes popular in Southern China first as well. So, you know, there's this link between Southern China and Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, the monopoly that the China, you know, really uh, enjoys vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia is porcelain. 
Uh, and you know, the problem with uh, you know, Chinese trade is that uh, the, the Chinese dynasties uh, uh, demanded a tribute relationship, specifically the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty really uh, cranked down, uh, cracked down on this and said that uh, unless your country becomes a vassal state of China, we will not trade with you, <laughs> which causes problems, which I'll talk about in the Chinese history uh, section. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as you accept that tributary relationship, you can trade with China. Uh, but Ch China is never closed. China is always open. Uh, and after 1500s, uh, there's going to be free trade because Chinese merchants will be allowed to leave and Chinese merchants will come to Southeast Asia, bringing Chinese goods, and then you know these merchants would just trade freely in Southeast Asia. So, so uh, Southeast Asia doesn't have much of a problem with trading with China. <clears throat> All right, so the country I wanna focus on first is Thailand. So we're now talking about uh, the Ayutthaya Kingdom of Thailand from 1351 to 1767. Uh, you know, uh, our uh, definition of early modern is when the world is united through trade or linked through trade, not united, linked through trade. Uh, so I, the Ayutthaya kingdom actually starts a little bit before that, but you know, it goes well into that period where it's linked through trade. So we'll go with the Ayutthaya kingdom. <laughs> uh, so the Thai peoples, uh, according to their legends, as I explained in the previous uh, video on uh, Southeast Asia, uh, came from the Southern part of China. Um, and when they came to Southeast Asia, initially they were dominated by the Cambodians. The Cambodians had their vast empire, the Angkor Empire. Uh, but eventually, you know, the, the Thais get rid of Cambodian rule and start to become independent. One of these early kingdoms is the Sukhothai Kingdom. Um, the Ayutthaya Kingdom emerges afterwards and they become ultimately the dominant kingdom of uh, the Thais. So the most important king uh, in the early histories is probably King Nareswan. Uh, king Nareswan uh, reigned from 1590 to 1605. Now we're fully into the early modern period. Um, and the reason why he's probably the most important early ruler is because he's the guy who overthrows Burmese rule. So the Cambodians were initially the dominant peoples, but, uh, and the Thais will eventually become one of the major players. But another major group that becomes really important in Southeast Asia are the Burmese. Um, and the Burmese had actually at one point expanded their influence into modern day Thailand and actually put most of Thailand under its control. Um, now, uh, this is like a loose form of vassalage that these uh, kingdoms imposed on each other. Um, but, you know, uh, King Nairaswan didn't even want that and finally manages to overthrow uh, Burmese rule and make Ayutthaya fully independent. And from here, uh, the Thais will actually begin to wage expansionist wars to expand uh, the kingdom of uh, Ayutthaya. Um, and then its successor uh, uh, kingdom is the currently existing Bangkok dynasty of Thailand. All right. So uh, why were the Thais able to do this? Uh, the primary reason I think Thais were able to do this is because uh, they did a series of uh, trade deals that actually enriched the kingdom. So. Thailand manages, managed to use trade for its benefit. This is part of the reason why I want to start with Thailand, because I want to start with the success story, really, of how uh, you know, uh, international trade doesn't necessarily mean doing the, bids of, during the bidding of foreigners. International trade could mean strengthening your own hand if you play your cards right. Um, okay, but before I get there, here are some uh, domestic things that the Thais in the Ayutthaya Kingdom did that's important. Uh, one is that they talked about uh, divine kingship. The idea here is that the Thai kings are reincarnations of a uh, Buddhist slash Hindu god. Uh, I believe that they're supposed to be reincarnations of Rama. So if your king is a reincarnation of a god, you don't really want to you know, disobey your king. So this increases the authority of the king. And this is backed up by the Brahmin priests. Uh, the Brahmin priests are the ones who actually like, you know, help uh, keep this... Uh, you know, legend alive. So that's divine kingship, that's one. Uh, another uh, uh, problem was, uh, before I get to the Uparaja, I'm gonna talk about the governance section here. Another problem of Southeast Asia was that uh, there was plenty of land, but there wasn't enough people. Uh, 
which to me, it seems kind of hard to believe because Thailand, not Thailand, but you know, Southeast Asia in general doesn't necessarily have a low population density, but apparently in the early modern period, they had a low population density. Um, and so, you know, one of the major problems was there simply was too much land and not enough people. So what they did was when they went to war, they didn't focus too much on conquering land, but instead they focused on capturing people. So uh, when you win battles against enemy, then you march into enemy territory and you round up all the peasants <laughs> and then you bring them back home and then they become your serfs or your peasants. Uh, uh, sometimes people will be turned into slaves as well. So slavery was uh, there. <clears throat> so uh, the king uh, commands an army to actually lead these expeditions and then they come back with people, <laughs> which is pretty bad, but I don't think they're bought and sold because they're more treated like serfs. Uh, so the reason why I call them serfs is because you know they're not bought and sold, but they're tied to the land. So. Uh, that that's actually quite analogous to the European situation where people are people don't have the freedom of movement. A, a serf doesn't have the freedom of movement, but serfs aren't bought and sold. <clears throat> okay, um, uh, and, but the difference with the, with the medieval Europe here is that in medieval Europe uh, there is uh, it exists, but it's rare. Right, the idea that you can have multiple lords. In the case of uh, Thailand, that's actually uh, pretty common. Uh, Southeast Asia in general basically was a place in which uh, vassals could have many uh, overlords. They, they could just pick and choose. So although you know, people sort of see these maps, I'll show you this map again, see, see these maps and go, wow, this is a big kingdom. I mean, so a ruler over here might be subservient to both the Thai kings in uh, Ayutthaya somewhere over here. Oh, here it is, Ayutthaya over here and to a Cambodian king. It's very possible that you, know, you could be loyal to two or a ruler over on this side of Thailand could be subservient to both the Thai kings and to the Burmese king. Um, and obviously the Burmese would say, this is our territory and the Thais would say, this is our territory. Um, but the truth is that the locals are actually you know, subservient to both. So uh, it's actually more complicated. Uh, the only reason why we use these maps is because you know, we're used to seeing these kinds of territorial, territorial maps that show nice clean borders. Um, so you know, uh, I'm showing it to you. <laughs> uh, and you know, in the European context, that idea becomes more and more prevalent after 1648 of these you know, contiguous, well, not, maybe not contiguous, but these clean borders that says, this is my land, that's your land. Uh, whereas before in Europe, that's not necessarily the case, and it's certainly not the case in Southeast Asia. So uh, they fight wars uh, and uh, they use uh, foreigners to their uh, benefit, and then they capture people, and then that strengthens the power of the king. So, how are the foreigners used to their benefits? I, I talked about this at the beginning, now I'm going to talk specifically. So, in terms of trade, to the Ayutthaya kingdom uh, comes Chinese people, uh, Indian merchants, uh, Persian merchants, Arab merchants, uh, European merchants like the Portuguese, um, and Vietnamese merchants and Japanese merchants. Basically, everybody from around the world shows up here. <laughs> this is what I mean by Thailand is the uh, not Thailand, Southeast Asia is the center of the world. And you know, as I said earlier, you know, they one of the things they exported was deerskin. They also export wood and rice. Uh, very wooded area. <clears throat> All right. uh, and the imports are you know Chinese silk, Indian cotton. Um, but more uh, importantly, uh, from the Europeans, they begin to import guns. Okay? So the Thais begin to arm themselves with guns uh, and cannons. And not only do they import guns and cannons, they actually hire Portuguese and European mercenaries uh, as uh, engineers to help them build forts, to help them make cannons and all these kinds of things. Uh, from Japan, they import things like swords, but they also import mercenaries. Well, import's the wrong word, but uh, Japanese uh, merchants come to Ayutthaya, Thailand, and they actually begin to form a mercenary company. So samurai mercenary armies are operating in Southeast Asia. <laughs> uh, and all these traders are all over the place. So what the Ayutthaya kings do is they basically say, okay, uh, we're gonna get the Chinese to control all the trade between Thailand and all the countries of the East. And we're gonna get the Persian merchants to control all the trade between Thailand and all the countries to the West. So 
uh, the Chinese merchants are given this privilege that they are now overseers of all trade between Thailand and countries in the East and Persian merchants become also get this privileged position of you know, uh, looking over trade between Thailand and all the countries in the West. What that means is <laughs> the Thai kings require kickback. <laughs> I'm giving you this privilege so that you have this control over all this trade. In return, you got to pay up. And so this is how the Thai kings managed to uh, tax uh, you know, the foreign trade. And with that money, they can then hire Japanese mercenaries, Western mercenaries, Western engineers. Um, and this is what leads to, uh, you know, uh, Ayutthaya becoming uh, slowly dominant uh, in the, this region. <clears throat> All right. So uh, King Naresvan also has a very famous story of the elephant battle. So the Burmese were trying to, you know, control this part of the world. Um, King Naraswan, you know, uh, rises uh, to say, no, we don't want to be uh, subjugated by you anymore. Um, and according to one of the stories, what happens is uh, King Naraswan uh, is riding an elephant uh, into battle um, and he meets uh, Prince Mingi Swa of Burma, the crown prince of Burma. And there they have a one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, essentially a duel. Um, so that's what some of the uh, sources say. Uh, others basically say that this is legend, uh, that you know, uh, King Naraswan didn't you know, publicly challenge the prince to a one-on-one -on -one duel and the prince then accepted. It was more like a chance encounter. Um, and in this chance encounter, uh, well, what happened was uh, the prince was actually shot by a, uh, uh, you know, one of the musket men on the Thai side. Uh, and this is the reason why uh, Prince Naraswan won. The legend has it that they fought a one-on-one -on -one duel and Prince Naraswan was able to defeat the, the prince in one-to-one -one combat. Uh, at this point in time, there's nobody to know for sure. <laughs> but I think it's an amazing story because here you have a king and a crown prince uh, fighting on elephant back. Um, so, you know, it's famous justly so. All right. <clears throat> so this foreign influence, right? Um, here's what I mean by like, you know, ultimately Thailand's in charge. So one of the uh, foreign uh, mercenaries to show up in Thailand from Japan was this fellow named Yamada Nagamasa. So Yamada Nagamasa was born sometime around 1590 and he died in 1630. Uh, and he is said to have arrived in Thailand in 1612. So this is when you know, the Jap Japanese traders are active overseas. Um, and so you have Japan towns in Southeast Asia and you know, Thailand is not an exception. And Yamada Nagamasa becomes one of the leaders of the Japan town in Ayutthaya. And by 1617, he becomes the leader and is also the leader of the Japanese mercenary company uh, fighting for the Thai kings. Uh, this Japanese mercenary company is anywhere between 200 to 800 men. So on the left here, this is the image of you know, the Japanese mercenary company led by Yamada Nagamasa. So that's the Japanese flag and you know, <laughs> you're a samurai riding horseback. <laughs> Not horseback, but the elephant back. It's very strange uh, imagery, but there you go. Anyway, uh, you know, after he becomes uh, the leader, uh, he marries the king's daughter um, and actually uh, gains uh, something like third rank or something like that, but he becomes an aristocrat within Thai society. Um, but uh, there are rumors that the Japanese might uh, betray the dynasty, uh, that, you know, they might not be loyal. And so in 1630, Yamada Nagamasa is assassinated and Japantown in Ayutthaya, Thailand gets burned to the ground. Uh, that's in 1630. <laughs> so that's how, you know, he comes to an end. Uh, so, you know, it's like the Thais are using foreigners and the foreigners are helping the Thais, but you have to keep in mind that the people really in charge ultimately are the Thais, not the foreigners, right? Um, and in the case of Japantown, what happens is that five years later, uh, the Japanese government in Edo basically forbids the uh, travel of Japanese merchants overseas. And because you know, they're not allowed to leave, you know, Japan towns in Southeast Asia basically dwindle and disappear. And this is not an exception. This is one of those Japan towns that disappear. Uh, the, the Japanese merchants who are left overseas basically eventually intermarry with the locals and they lose their identity as Japanese. So the guy on the right is by a fellow is a fellow by the name of Constantine Falcon. Uh, so you, you can actually see the name here, Constantino Falcon or Polkin, right? 
So he's a Greek Venetian uh, dude uh, who actually works for the uh, English East India Company and eventually adopts the English uh, citizenship. But <laughs> so he becomes Protestant, right? So he's he's Greek and Venetian. So he's either Catholic or Orthodox. But then he becomes Protestant, and then he comes in the English East India Company ships to Thailand. And after he comes to Thailand, apparently somewhere along the line, he meets uh, a Japanese uh, Portuguese uh, woman. So you know, Japanese people were exiled. Uh, not, I mean, Japanese Christians were exiled. Uh, her parents probably were one of those people. They were never allowed to return to Japan. Um, so you know, she, uh, she is actually the uh, daughter of a Japanese Portuguese uh, marriage, and she resided in Bengal, India. <laughs> but she came to uh, Thailand, and you know, because she is Catholic, presumably he converted to Catholicism. Either that, or he converts to Catholicism and then meets a Catholic wife. One or the other, I forget exactly which. But this Maria de Pina is also uh, pretty famous because uh, after uh, Constantine Falcon's death, uh, she becomes a uh, court cook and actually makes a lot of uh, dessert dishes that are still popular in Thailand today. <laughs> so it's like this, this weird global connection that you see, right? Because you know, here you have one guy that you know, is connected to Eastern Europe and to Western Europe. Uh, and they're in Thailand and he meets this Jap half Japanese, half Portuguese woman from uh, Bengal, India <laughs> in Thailand and they get married. Um, anyway, because he converts to Catholicism, you know, he does the, not the bidding, but he tries to help out fellow Catholics, understandably so. And one of the groups he tries to help out are the French. And so for this, he actually gains, uh, he becomes a knight, uh, the knight of the Order of St. Michael in fr uh, of France. So he actually gets a, a medal from Louis XIV and is knighted. <laughs> uh, by 1685, he becomes the chief advisor to the uh, Thai king at the time, King Narai. Um, but this is where his downfall comes in. Uh, instead of suggesting a, uh, a Buddhist uh, uh, successor to the king, uh, you know, Constantine Falcon suggests to King Narai that, that he should appoint his Catholic son to be uh, the next heir. Um, and this is probably his undoing. Uh, people were kind of, you know, didn't like his, too, didn't like the fact that he had too much influence over the king. Uh, and this probably was the thing that pushed people over the edge. And so in 1688, uh, Prince uh, uh, Petracha basically launches a coup uh, and you know, uh, jails his own father, uh, arrests, and then executes Constantine Falcon. And after his execution, his wife's not killed. His wife becomes a court cook. Um, and afterwards, the Thai kings expel all foreigners. So again, right? I mean, the point here is that Thailand is in charge of its relations with the outside world. And now that it has managed to become the most powerful kingdom in Southeast Asia, in this part of Southeast Asia anyway, your services are no longer required. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's the most powerful kingdom in Southeast Asia, I'd say. But yeah, so there you go. <laughs> um, others point to this and say that, you know, and, and this is the moment when South uh, Thailand begins to lose its dominant position because they no longer get, you know, a new information from coming out from an outside world. I don't necessarily know for sure. That's not the reason why. Thailand declined. So here's the reason why Thailand eventually declines. So that goes back to the Uparaja, <coughs> uh, who I skipped. The Thai kings are polygamous. They have many wives, not just four like in Islamic custom. They can have as many wives as they want. So they have lots and lots of kings. Uh, this is reason why you know uh, Constantine Falcon could suggest that you know the a Catholic uh, child should be the next king because the king has lots and lots of kids. And so, you know, Jesuit missionaries and other Christian missionaries, you know, try to convert these people to Christianity and they succeeded in converting one of the princes. All right. So then if you have many princes, how do you choose which one should be the next king? And the solution in Ayutthaya kingdom was to select the crown prince, right? The, the name was called Uparaja, more literally the vice king, but you, you pick a crown prince. 
Typically, it's the son, but it could be the brother. Um, and the point is that as soon as the king dies, this guy becomes the new king. And initially, this worked out reasonably well because you know, you're selecting your heir while you're alive. Uh, but eventually, people begin to, well, the Uparajas begin to realize, hey, I'm just waiting for my father or I'm just waiting for my brother to die. Why don't I just hasten this? <laughs> Make it happen faster. <laughs> and so what eventually begins to happen is that the Uparajas, once they are selected as such, so until they get selected as Uparajas, the princes that you know, compete to see who's the best, but once they get selected, then they begin to scheme to see, to see if they can actually hasten the king's downfall so that they can take over next. And this automatically then causes uh, you know, strife within the kingdom because there will always be factions within the aristocracy who will side with the king and factions within the aristocracy that will side with the prince because you know the prince is younger <laughs> nobody lives forever <laughs> so if you know this guy is going to be the next king do you want to side with the king who's kind of old and may die you know in the, the near future or do you want to side with the crown prince who you know is going to be the next king and will be in charge for a long time so <clears throat> i mean if the crown prince is young so you know yeah, <laughs> this, this is the this is ultimately what drives down uh, the Ayutthaya kingdom. It's actually an internal power struggle that causes you know a divide within the leadership, and this internal civil strife ultimately is what weakens the kingdom, and that is why the Ayutthaya kingdom in 1767 is conquered by the Burmese, uh, and you know Thailand once again has to live under the Burmese yoke until they get rid of the Burmese, and once they get rid of the Burmese, they then become independent one more time. And it's the current uh, kingdom of Thailand that exists today. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, very briefly, other places. Um, so, you know, uh, Cambodia was the dominant country in Southeast Asia, uh, but around the 14th and 15th century, before we enter the early modern period, towards the tail end of the Middle Ages, uh, or the, the previous period, the Cambodian uh, empire basically began to collapse. Um, and you know, contact with the West doesn't really help in uh, you know, restoring the fortunes of the Cambodians. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, their Angkor kingdom is basically gobbled up to a huge extent by the Thais over on this side. Uh, the kingdom of Champa on the east, uh, the Chams here, but the kingdom of Champa in the east was the buffer state between Cambodia and Vietnam, but once Champa is more or less destroyed, then the Vietnamese then continue to push down um, and you know, Cambodia is like squeezed uh, between these two uh, kingdoms, uh, Thailand and uh, Vietnam. All right. So in the case of Vietnam, um, from 1406 to 1427, uh, there's a period when Ming China conquers uh, Vietnam and at that point, you know, Vietnam basically consisted only of its northern part, and it was all conquered by the Chinese. Uh, but obviously, the Vietnamese uh, aren't happy with that. Uh, you know, they used to be ruled by the Chinese uh, until around like 1000 AD, until they got rid of it. I think I talked about this in the previous lecture. So one more time, <laughs> they revolt against the Chinese and finally get rid of them. And the dynasty that gets rid of the Chinese rule is the Le dynasty. And uh, the same dynasty is responsible for expanding southwards. Now, the expansion south actually uh, had uh, positives, obviously, because you know, the Vietnamese could now live further and further south and could expand their territory. Uh, but it also had a negative consequence in the sense that uh, there is this really tall mountain range right on the coast. And so you get this section in the northern part of Vietnam that's the heart of you know, Vietnam, the old Vietnam. And then you get the southern part that they recently conquered uh, that's also very, very fertile. So you get the population of the north and the south and very thin strip of land to connect the north and the south. So um, some people say that Vietnam is like a dumbbell, right? Um, and because of this, uh, it, it was not exactly surprising that the, the kingdom is going to split between the northern and southern dynasties. So initially, it is the Max that you know form a you know, breakaway uh, kingdom of their own. Um, but then the you know the Le dynasty, with the help of the Trinh and uh, 
uh, when uh, aristocrats manage to uh, defeat uh, the Max, but then as soon as they are defeated, then the Trin lords and the Wen lords begin to fight against each other. <laughs> One more time for supremacy. Um, and finally, the uh, uh, Taesong rebellion, you know, uh, basically brings an end to the uh, uh, Le dynasty. Uh, the Taesong rebellion, uh, in turn, is quelled by uh, the, the Nin dynasty. Uh, the, Nguyen, I can never pronounce this name right, but I think it's like Nguyen, uh, uh, that's the name, right? This, this name here. Like if I were to pronounce it as a regular American who doesn't understand how to pronounce uh, Vietnamese names, I would probably say Nguyen, but uh, I think it's more properly pronounced Nguyen. <clears throat> anyway, moving on. Uh, boom, Burma. <clears throat> so Burma, uh, is a, a multi-ethnic country that's over here. Um, and the heart of Burma is the Irrawaddy River Basin here. The Irrawaddy River runs right through it. Um, and in 1510, the Taungo Dynasty uh, basically uh, unifies Burma. Uh, most of Burma is unified under the Taungo Dynasty. And then from there, they begin to fight expansionist wars to you know, expand uh, and they invade uh, Thailand. This is why Thailand and Vietnam are Burma. Uh, Thailand and uh, the Burmese are the major rivals. There's no real major war between Thailand and uh, Vietnam. Vietnam is focused on fighting against the Chinese or on expanding southwards towards the former Champa lands. Uh, the Taungo dynasty collapses in 1752 and in return, uh, and in its place rises the Kombang dynasty. Uh, the Kombang dynasty has to fight a short war of unification. Uh, and when the unification is done in 1767, they will then fight you know, wars against the Thais, the Laotians, and the Cambodians to, again, one more time, assert dominance in Southeast Asia. So uh, I could have chosen you know, like one of the three. I wasn't going to do all three. And I, I chose uh, Thailand here. OK. So now let's talk about you know, the sea-based countries. So um, I'm going to start with the Dutch East India Company, because this actually will link us to what's going on in Europe. Um, and because the Dutch East India Company is like you know, in various places, so it, it, you can actually cover a broad area with you know, looking at them. So the Dutch East India Company, uh, or the Fair Einigde West Indische Company, or VOC, as I like to call it, because it's just easier to uh, say instead of the Dutch East India Company, which is a mouthful, uh, is founded in 1602. Um, and they begin to set up, uh, you know, trade with uh, Asia and Europe. And in 1619, uh, they set up their bases in Indonesia, in Java, and in the Spice Islands. So the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company will eventually be Batavia. But uh, Batavia is in Java, and, you know, they, they will be uh, the rulers of the, the Spice Islands. All right, so let's look what's going to happen. Right. Oh, and they rule until 16, 1799, from 1619 to 1799. Um, basically, what happens is that the, uh, the French Revolution happens. And when the French Revolution happens, uh, the, its uh, effects basically hit the Dutch as well. Um, and when the Dutch have their own uh, you know, Republican form of government, uh, the, uh, they, uh, they abolish the Dutch East India Company. And the territory of the East India Company is now held by the Dutch government. But because they are allies of the French, uh, the British declare war on the Dutch, or they actually are subsumed within Napoleon's empire, to be more precise, really. Uh, you know, the British see that you know, the Dutch territories are now fair game. And uh, in 1811, uh, the British conquer uh, the Dutch East, India Dutch East India Company territories in Indonesia. Uh, but then, you know, after you know, British conquest, you get the uh, Congress of Vienna, where all these European powers are talking to each other after the defeat of Napoleon. Um, so that's from 1814 to 1815. Um, and with the Congress of Vienna, the agreement is signed so that the British actually return uh, the Indonesian islands back to the Dutch. And so from 1816 onwards to 1942, the Dutch government is in charge of you know, modern day Indonesia or the territories that will become modern day Indonesia. Okay, 
So the Dutch East India Company is a monopoly trading company. As a monopoly trading company, its goal is to make money by trading between Asia and Holland. Um, and so what you do is you try to bring back goods that you can't make back home. So, you know, uh, spices, cotton, silk, porcelain, all these things. But the Dutch East India Company, now that they are actually going to do this, they have to figure out a way to get the money necessary to buy all these things. The Dutch East India Company uh, doesn't have uh, silver mines or gold mines like the Spaniards do. Uh, the Dutch are at war with Spain for a long period of time, so that's also kind of problematic. And so the Dutch solution is actually to conduct multiple uh, intra-Asian trades. So trades within Asia to make a profit, and then using that profit to buy Asian goods and then bringing those goods back to Europe. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they will be like the, the people who will bring Japanese silver, for example, from Japan to China and in making huge amounts of money uh, in that uh, you know, exporting of Japanese silver to China, they will use that to buy goods in China uh, or Southeast Asia or India and then bring back home to uh, Britain, uh, not Britain, to uh, Holland, to the Netherlands. Um, another solution, uh, instead of you know, becoming a middleman trader for other Asian countries, another solution is to actually make products uh, of your own. And so the island of Java basically become the center of uh, plantation production for the Dutch. So uh, if you guys like coffee, I drink tea by the way, but if you guys like coffee, then you have heard of Java coffee. It's called Java coffee because it's made in the island of Java, or at least originally it was made in the island of Java. So there you go, coffee, tea, indigo, uh, rubber, sugar, tobacco, all these things are created in the plantations of Java. <clears throat> All right. um, and of course, the most lucrative thing is spices. This is the main reason why Europeans came to uh, Asia after all, spices. So the Portuguese actually tried to control the spice trade and failed. The Dutch solution would be different. The Dutch solution is not to control the trade itself. The Dutch solution is to control the production itself. And if that means terrorizing the locals, massacring them and enslaving them, well, so be it. And so they did exactly that. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit of detail uh, you know, uh, when we get to the next bit. Uh, but for now, let me move on. The, the VOC is not active only in Indonesia. Uh, they actually managed to conquer Taiwan for a while from 1624 to 1662. Um, and Taiwan becomes the basis of Dutch trade with China. But then you know, the Chinese pirate lord by the name of Koksenga, who's actually part, you know, half Chinese, half Japanese, uh, kicks the Dutch out, and so the Dutch actually lose a foothold in uh, uh, Taiwan in 1662. Uh, they conquer Malacca from the Portuguese. Uh, that conquest happens in 1641, and they hold on to Malacca pretty much until the 19th century. Um, when the British come and conquer Malacca, uh, there is talk about getting Malacca back, but ultimately they agree that you know, the British will be able to keep Malacca, but instead uh, the Dutch will get the British colonies in the island of Sumatra. So this is the origin of modern day you know, Malaysia and modern day Indonesia as we understand these countries today. Um, the Dutch also build settler colonies in South Africa. This is as a refueling station so that the Dutch ships can get food, water, and anything else they need by staying at the Cape Colony. Um, Cape Colony is so strategic that when the British conquer it, uh, they basically say to the Dutch, uh, this one we're not returning to you guys. And so the Dutch uh, don't get anything back. Uh, Dutch Ceylon is an island in, you know, is the modern island of, uh, the island country of Sri Lanka. Um, and initially it was dominated by Portuguese traders. But in 1640, the Dutch come and they take over the Dutch, the Portuguese held portions from uh, Portuguese, obviously, uh, with local help. Um, and they will rule uh, most of Ceylon uh, and they will definitely control the trade until 1796. Um, and other ports that the Dutch will engage in trade with would be uh, the island of uh, Hirado, or uh, where the Dutch come to trade in Japan. Later, after 1639, the Dutch will be given 
uh, territory in Nagasaki, an artificial island in Nagasaki, and that becomes a base of trade between the Dutch and Japan uh, from 1639 all the way to 1859. Um, Canton is open to foreigners after 1683. So although the Dutch are kicked out of Taiwan and initially there's no way to them to conduct trade, uh, once uh, Canton is opened after 1683, the Dutch can show up and trade with the Chinese. When trading with India, the most important port is the Indian port of Surat. Uh, this is where uh, the Mughal Empire basically uh, conducts foreign trade by sea with foreigners, um, and the Dutch are one of many who engage in trade uh, with the Indians there. And Safavid Iran, uh, in its competition against the Ottomans, uh, actually invite foreigners uh, to come and trade through Iran. And in the case of the Dutch, they, you know, some of the ships actually take up the offer and they go through the Strait of Hormuz to the port city of Bandar Abbas. And from there, uh, you know, they can get goods uh, you know, uh, from Persia uh, and into uh, Persia slash further north into Russia. So the Dutch East India Company uh, is a very wide ranging trading company that's spread all over, right? So Cape Colony is down here. Uh, Surat is over here. Bandar Abbas to trade with the Safavids is over here. Uh, this is the island of Sumatra. This is the island of Java here. Uh, the island of Hirado is over here. And Canton is right over here. Uh, north of Hai Hainan Island there, and the Dutch used to control uh, uh, the island of Taiwan there and the island of uh, Ceylon here. So uh, they're all over the place, right? And they're conducting these trades uh, and they're particularly trying to do like intra-agent trades to make money so they can use that money to bring goods back home to uh, uh, Europe. So, you know, like any company, the goal is to make money. <laughs> but they find out you know, that the Portuguese tried to dominate the shipping routes and they failed. Um, so, all right, maybe we can't control the trade routes, but what the Dutch can do is they can dominate by the sheer volume. And so uh, you know, the French ships that was back, going back and forth between Europe and Asia was numbering anywhere between 500 to 600 this is in 1670. Uh, the British ships were anywhere between 3,000 to 4,000, but the Dutch ships, the Dutch East India Company ships that's operating you know, all throughout Asia and between Europe and Asia is over 15,000 ships. Uh, right? So uh, this statistic is coming from like French sources. So we're not sure exactly how accurate it is, but uh, it basically shows you that the Dutch are far and above trading, uh, trading more, uh, far and above more than anybody else in Europe. Uh, so gaining control over the spice production areas. The Portuguese who first arrived in Europe uh, also were the first to arrive in Ceylon Island to trade in cinnamon, um, but apparently they weren't exactly liked by the locals. <laughs> so the locals worked with the Dutch to get rid of the Portuguese and instead of the Portuguese trading with them from that point onwards, the Dutch would trade with the locals to get cinnamon and various other goods. So that's the island of Ceylon, which is, you know, uh, cooperation against a common enemy, you know, like, like pretty common story. You know. All right. Spice Island, this is a, a, a more devastating story. So the Spice Islanders were actually, you know, sitting pretty because, you know, uh, Indian merchants, Chinese merchants, uh, other Southeast Asia merchants, uh, Arab merchants, and then now the Portuguese, like, but all these people were coming over them and saying, hey, we want your stuff, like, you know, the spices, uh, cloves, nutmeg, and mace. And they're like, oh, okay, well, you want to pay this much, you want to pay that much, well, we'll sell to the highest bidder. Um, the Dutch arrive, and the first thing they do is they get rid of their European rivals. So they get rid of the Portuguese, and they attack uh, English ships, and eventually, by the 1660s, they manage to get rid of, you know, European influence out of Southeast Asia, or, you know, the spice, near the Spice Islands, Spice Islands, by the way. So that's the first thing they do. Uh, then once they have basically a near monopoly position, they then try to enforce their monopoly control over the production of spices onto the islanders themselves. So obviously the islanders are not happy about this. And the Dutch solution then was to go out and massacre the natives. 
uh, but they keep at least 1,000 people alive. <laughs> so you're killing tens of thousands of people, but you're keeping 1,000 people alive. Why? The reason why they're keeping these people alive is because the Dutch don't know how to grow the spices themselves. Only the locals know how to grow the spices themselves. Only the locals know how to grow cloves, how to grow nutmeg and mace. And so to make sure that they hold on to the local knowledge, they don't kill them all, but they massacre almost everybody except for like 1,000 to 10,000 people, which is a warning. <laughs> don't mess with us. <laughs> right? The company is doing this for money. The VOC company is doing this for money. Killing people for money. <laughs> and those who survived, well, you know, they lost, so they're all turned into slaves. And so I talked about how, like, the Dutch brought the Southeast Asian slaves to South Africa at one point to their Dutch colony here. These are the Southeast Asian slaves, right? The Spice Islanders who tried to, you know, sell goods as they see fit to the highest bidder, as per usual in the past, got crushed by the VOC. Uh, and huge numbers of them got massacred and the survivors were turned into slaves. Uh, some of these slaves were shipped across the Indian Ocean to Africa. So there you go. <laughs> uh, now, I also talked about how Southeast Asia had a uh, population problem, that the population density was low in Southeast Asia. So when the Dutch actually tried to produce goods that cannot be made back home, so goods like sugar, coffee, tea, indigo, tobacco, rubber, tea, uh, spices, all these things, uh, they hit into this problem. Where are we going to get the workers from? And the Dutch solution was to import Chinese workers. So, you know, Southeast Asia really is the center of the world. And by the way, this is the image of Batavia. I probably should have put this earlier, but you know, this is a European style city built in Java, right, to be the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company. And because it's built by the Dutch and because there's all the shipping, notice that there are canals all throughout the city so that ships can go in and out, right? Canals, 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 canals. <clears throat> so Southeast Asia is Indonesia, just like uh, Thailand is a place where all these foreigners gather. Um, and in this case, the Dutch are in charge. So Batavia, is the headquarters of the VOC in Asia. Uh, some of the local aristocrats, some of the Javanese aristocrats, basically work with the VOC in their wars against their local enemies. So notice that there's no sense of nationalism here. That I, there is no national identity as Indonesians here. Uh, these Javanese aristocrats think of themselves as you know, a local Javanese aristocrat, and you know, they hate their local enemy more than the newly arriving foreigners. And so they work with the newly arriving Dutch to defeat their traditional enemies. And in the process, the Dutch gain more and more power until eventually the Dutch dominate the island of Java. Right? So the VOC will conquer Java Island, and then later they will then push into the island of Sumatra, where they will face resistance. Uh, they bring in Chinese merchants, and because there is a lack of workers, uh, a lack of people, uh, instead of kidnapping people like you know, <laughs> they were doing in the, you know, the Thailand, Cambodia, and Burma, uh, here what they do instead is they uh, invite Chinese laborers to come from China and to work in the plantations of Indonesia. So Chinese merchants and Chinese laborers show up. Uh, Japanese traders and Japanese mercenaries also show up. Uh, the traders and mercenaries, I, I should put down traders, and merchants and mercenaries, uh, basically arrive until 1639. Um, because in 1639, Japan is going to be closed to the outside world. And when they are closed, the VOC will no longer be able to hire Japanese mercenaries. And Japanese merchants don't show up anymore. Um, and you know, I, I talked about the massacre and the enslavement of the Spice Islanders. <clears throat> so there you go, right? Uh, people from around the world showing up to Southeast Asia. Uh, in the case of Thailand, they use it to their benefit. In the case of Indonesia, well, the Javanese kind of got screwed. But in Indonesia's Aceh, which is in the northern tip of Sumatra, it's not as simple. So uh, in Aceh, which is you know here, uh, a sultanate emerged. And people generally date the emergence of the Sultanate at 1520. But as far as I can tell, like the first Sultan is usually this guy called uh, Ali Mugayat Saya. 
And he's supposed to reign starting in 1514. So I like I put this question mark here because wait, doesn't that mean that the Sultanate then starts in 1514? <laughs> I don't know. So uh, it it probably means that you know the Sultan is older than 1520 or 1514, and we don't really know. But the first definitive date is 1520, and 1514 is the supposed date for uh, Ali Mughayat Saya. Anyway. Um, Aceh is the country that formed the alliance with the Ottomans, if you guys remember that lecture on uh, Africa, specifically Ethiopia. So the Portuguese and the Ethiopians fought a war uh, against the Ottomans and the uh, Adal Sultanate. And the Port Ottomans, not only did they sign an alliance or you know, uh, work with the Adal Sultanate, the Ottomans wanted to make sure they had control, that they had access to spices coming from uh, Asia for the east, so they made contact with the Aceh Sultanate. So the people of Aceh by this point in time were Muslims. And once they actually uh, make that link, uh, Aceh is not going to be you know, easily conquered by uh, the Europeans, right? So trade and links with the outside world in this case is actually helping out the locals, right? Unlike in Java. Um, and once they find out that the Ottomans are looking for black pepper in particular, uh, the kingdom of Aceh, the Sultanate of Aceh, would produce so much black pepper that at one point they were producing roughly half of the global black pepper supply. <laughs> and they become known as the pepper lords, right? They made huge amounts of money with pepper, with the pepper trade. And with this huge amounts of money, what can you do? Well, one of the things you can do is you can, you know, hire a mercenary army, you know, make your army strong. Um, uh, you know, uh, they can also buy elephants, you know, have elephant units, <laughs> you know, not for parade, but, you know, elephants, war elephants, right? Um, and uh, Iskandar Muda is the uh, Achenese king who is probably uh, most famous because he actually tries to expand the empire as much as he can. And one of his big expeditions uh, is to uh, take back uh, Malacca from the Portuguese. So Malacca had fallen to the Portuguese in the 1500s. Um, and after about 100 years, Iskandar Muda attempts to try to get Portuguese back, uh, get Malacca back from the Portuguese into the hands of the Muslims one more time. Uh, unfortunately for Iskandar Muda, Iskandar, by the way, means Alexander. So unfortunately for Alexander Muda, that attempt fails. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but, you know, as you can kind of tell from this map, right, the, the Aceh Sultanate uh, basically uh, starts off here in the north. Their capital is Bandar Aceh, or Kutaraja, which is over here. Uh, and they expand to encompass most of the northern island of Sumatra. All right. So, you know, they use trade to their benefit. They had links with the Ottoman Empire, and they could get technological know-how, uh, and they could have, you know, trade. And with that trade money, they could, you know, buy weapons and uh, war elephants and, you know, outfit their navy and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what happened? Uh, in the 19th century, uh, in 1824, there is this thing called the Anglo-Dutch Treaty to swap the colonies. So the Dutch colonies in uh, the Malay Peninsula and the English colonies in Sumatra are swapped. And so the English consolidate their hold in the Malay Peninsula and the Dutch consolidate their hold in Java and in the southern part of Sumatra. And with that, they then begin to, the Dutch then begin to conquer the island of Sumatra. But the English for a long time didn't want the Dutch to go north because then they would butt heads with the, you know, the British holdings over here in the Malay Peninsula. And so they were backing up the Aceh Sultanate, <laughs> right? So, you know, the Europeans are fighting against each other too, right? They're not working in concert either. Um, but in 1871, the, the, the British and the Dutch signed an agreement to, you know, allow for the Dutch to conquer all of Sumatra. And three years later, the Dutch, you know, uh, you know, put their efforts really into the conquest of Sumatra. And finally, in 1874, the capital of Aceh, Kutaraja, or Bandar, Bandar Aceh, falls to the Dutch. Uh, the last Sultan escapes the fall of the capital and continues to fight a guerrilla war against the Dutch. But finally, in 1898, uh, he gives up and uh, 
the Dutch will be in charge of the island of Sumatra and the Aceh Sultanate in uh, uh, 1903 uh, will disappear. Right? He signed surrender in 1903. Oh, so oh, sorry, 1898 is when the Dutch actually put in another effort to really like, pacify the country. Um, and this time around, they basic, because the Sultan has escaped and is fighting a guerrilla war, starting in 1898, the Dutch basically tried to ignore the Sultan and just work with the local aristocrats and get the local aristocrats to sign pledges of allegiance to Dutch rule. Uh, and in 1903, after most of the country's aristocrats have signed these agreements, the Sultan surrenders. And so that's how the Sultanate ends. Sad story. <clears throat> okay, the Philippines, and we're almost done. So the Philippines is important for this reason. Uh, it was first discovered by Ferdinand Magellan in his you know, trip around the world. And Magellan himself dies in the uh, islands of Philippines. But the reason why it's important is because the Spaniards eventually figure out the trans-Pacific route of trade. So they go from Acapulco to Manila, Philippines, and then back, right? And by land, they go from Acapulco in the western part of what was then New Spain, but today Mexico, obviously, to Veracruz. And then Veracruz becomes the linchpin city for the, well, actually not, but becomes the origin point in the trade between uh, New, New Spain and Spain itself. So from Veracruz to Havana, and then Havana to Seville, and then Seville to Havana, and then Veracruz and Portobello. Portobello and Panama basically is the other places that's important because from here, they go to Lima. So this white line is the Spanish trade routes, and the blue line is the Portuguese shipping lanes, right? So the Spaniards and the Portuguese together create a global trade network. And the galleon, Manila galleons, the trans-Pacific route is the final leg that's necessary to actually make a linked global trade network. And this is the reason why you know, the Philippines is important. Uh, so once the, uh, so although Ferdinand Magellan claims the island of the Philippines for Spain, that claim is never enforced. You have to wait really 50 years or so. So in 1565, uh, the first permanent colonies are set up after the uh, Pacific Ocean was discovered, so the start of Manila Galleons. And then in 1571, 50 years after Ferdinand Magellan claimed the island of the Philippines, Manila, uh, the center of Northern Philippines is finally conquered and becomes the capital of the Philippines and Spanish rule finally is solidified. Uh, and by 1590s, most of the Northern Philippines is conquered. Uh, the Southern part of the Philippines is where Muslims live. The Northern part of the Philippines is where mostly pagan uh, Filipinos lived. Um, and so uh, the pagans didn't put up as much of a resistance as the uh, Muslims did. So. The Spaniards basically just say, all right, you guys are on your own. We're not gonna bother you anymore and leave most of the Southern Philippines alone. Although technically it is claimed to be part of Spanish Philippines. Um, these Muslims will finally pacified, will be finally pacified under American rule starting in you know, uh, the 20th century. All right. um, the Jesuits who then arrive after the Spaniards then begin to convert the locals and eventually uh, they establish uh, colleges so the earliest colleges in the Philippines are actually older than Harvard, the oldest university in America, or the oldest college in America. <laughs> uh, the Philippines has a longer history of higher education than America. Uh, and that's thanks to you know, uh, Spanish colonization. Uh, just like Mexico, Mexico does too, by the way. It's got an older university than the United States. Uh, so age isn't the most important thing. Right? Harvard is Harvard because it's got a faculty uh, and the student body. That, that's what makes it Harvard, uh, not, not the history per se. <clears throat> okay, neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, but you know, you could be a relatively new school, like uh, you know, the University of California schools and still be a very, very good school. You know, the whole point there. Okay, uh, so the Philippines is threatened by uh, Coxinga, just like, uh, you know, Coxinga kicked out the Dutch from, uh, uh, Taiwan, but Coxinga never uh, carries out his threat to uh, invade the Philippines and the Philippines is left alone in the hands of the uh, uh, Spaniards. Uh, instead, it's actually the British. In 1762, uh, the British come and they conquer Manila from the Spaniards. This is part of the Seven Years' War. So uh, the Philippines is a Spanish colony for a very long time, from 1521 to 1821, 
or from 1565 to 1821, or from 1571 to 1821. Well, either 300 full years, or at the shortest, 250 years under Spanish rule. It's a very long time. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, no, no. Uh, the, for 250 years or 300 years, it is under the vice royalty of, the, of New Spain. Um, and then in 1820, Mexico gains independence, not the Philippines. Sorry, that's my bad here. Uh, Mexico gains independence in 1821. And after Mexico gains independence, uh, Spain is going to rule the Philippines directly. And uh, Spanish rule in the Philippines will actually uh, be more paternalistic and more money would be poured into the Philippines. But that's more uh, uh, modern history, not early modern. So I'm not going to get there. OK. A uh, key point about the Philippines that one needs to remember is that uh, from the perspective of Spain, uh, it never made money. <laughs> so Spanish colonies, the vice royalty of New Spain, the vice royalty of Peru made gobs and gobs of money because they had these massive silver mines. So these massive silver mines produced all this silver and it kept the Spanish empire afloat. The Philippines was on the edges of the Spanish empire and it was always a money loser. It never made money. <laughs> so periodically, the Spanish government will constantly have arguments about well, what do we should do with the Philippines? It's never made any money. What the hell do we hold, why the hell do we hold on to this? Why don't we just get rid of it, right? So multiple uh, reasons are uh, given at each moment. Um, and here are some of the reasons why they hold on to the Philippines till the bitter end. One is that it is the trading station between China and Mexico. So this is what the merchants typically argue. They basically say that they need the Philippines because if you want to trade between Europe and China, between Spain and China, we Spaniards actually have a route that can go by sea, uh, kind of like what the Portuguese have. It's more secure to us, but we have it, so we don't want to lose that advantage compared to the rest of Europe. And so that means you basically go by boat from Spain to Mexico, and then you cross from Veracruz to Acapulco, and then you go from boat to Manila. And once you're in Manila, Chinese merchants show up to trade with you know, the Spaniards. Uh, the Japanese merchants showed up, uh, Indian merchants and Southeast Asian merchants also showed up to Manila. So Manila becomes an important trading station, so we, that's why we need to hold on to it. So that's one reason. Uh, this one is usually trotted out and you know, it's the most convincing reason why they hold on to it. Um, another reason why early people said, you know, very early on in the history, said that they want to hold on to the Philippines is because they're hoping to use it as a base to conquer China or Japan, right? So the conquistadors who still have memories of how uh, Hernan Cortes or Francisco Pizarro managed to conquer the vast Aztec empire or the vast Inca empire say, you know, give me some help. I will get on a boat and go to China or go to Japan and conquer these places. <laughs> uh, the good news is that the governor of the Philippines knew better. <laughs> and they basically said no to every single conquistador attempts or plans to conquer China or Japan. So China and Japan is not like the Aztecs and the Incas. <laughs> At this point in time, conquering these places will be impossible, so no. So that shot down. And the other option was, well, we need Mexico, we need the Philippines because it's gonna be the springboard to proselytize and spread Christianity in China and or Japan. Now, this one was a little bit more realistic, but eventually what happens is the Chinese government under the Qing dynasty will ban the spread of Christianity and the Japanese government under the Edo government will also ban the spread of uh, Christianity, more specifically Catholicism. So proselytization efforts will also fail, which means that the colonists, sorry, uh, the religious leaders focus on spreading uh, Christianity in the colony itself. And so they start building churches and colleges and later grade schools after 1821 in the Philippines. And that actually adds further to the budget of the colonial government. And so the colonial government is even more in the red. It's not making any money whatsoever because they have to build churches and schools. So obviously they don't make many money. <laughs> and it's like, the hell, why are we holding on to this? Well, we're saving souls. So, you know, stop complaining about money. It's, you know, one answer that you get. 
Uh, another reason why they hold on to it is because, uh, because the local population of the Philippines doesn't die as much from the various diseases that the Europeans bring in, unlike in uh, the New World. Uh, the Philippines basically is seen as a great place to send uh, third and fourth sons of aristocrats from Spain, um, and they can then have their new fiefdoms in the Philippines. <laughs> the Catholic Church also gets uh, territory in the Philippines, and the locals are treated as serfs. They become peasants for these aristocrats and the Catholic Church. So it's another reason why you want to hold on to the Philippines, because it's a piece of land that you can give out to your uh, aristocrats and to the church. And the final argument that they uh, use to hold on to the Philippines is that uh, once the Dutch begin to consolidate their hold on the Spice Islands and on Indonesia in general, this is starting in the uh, 1650s and after, uh, the Spanish uh, military leaders basically say, no, 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 we can't get rid of the Philippines. The Philippines is our buffer. That is our military base. If we give up the Philippines, there's a good chance that the Dutch, who are just south of the Philippines, so the Philippines is right here, the Spice Islands are right here, right? So the Dutch could, are just one hop away to take over the Philippines. The Southern Philippines is over here, it's ruled by you know, Muslim rulers that are ignored by you know, the Spanish authorities. But you know, if the Dutch somehow manage, somehow another managed to consolidate the Spice Islands, then there's just one hop, the Muslim countries here, away from Northern Philippines where the Spanish are. And from the Northern Philippines, then they could actually go take the Trans-Pacific route from Manila, Philippines and land in New Spain. And now our silver mines in Mexico will be in danger. So no, we have to hold on to the Philippines because it's a military base against the Dutch. So they're talking about a global strategic uh, reason for holding on to the Philippines. And this is another reason why they hold on to it. Uh, so, because every time they talk about getting rid of the Philippines as a colony because it's never making any money, people come out of the woodworks to defend the holding on to the Philippines. So, you know, starting in the 1700s, uh, just as the Bourbon reforms are happening in Spain itself, where they're trying to, like, you know, uh, you know, quote unquote, modernize it in the 70s, but, you know, make uh, government in, the Philippine, uh, in Spain up to date to what's available in the 1700s. There is an attempt to actually try to transform the Philippines into a more profitable colony uh, around the same time. So uh, the Spanish authorities begins to you know, build uh, plantations, so sugar and banana plantations. Uh, they encourage mining operations to try to make money in the Philippines, but all these also fail. <laughs> as a whole, the Philippines as a colony, the tax revenue that you get simply does not match uh, the cost of holding onto the Philippines. So the Philippines is constantly being subsidized by money from New Spain, Mexico. Which is why the independence of Mexico in 1821 was a huge blow to the Spanish empire because Mexico supplied a huge amount of money to you know, Spain to keep the empire running. And you know, after they lose Mexico, it's like, oh my God, where are we gonna get the money from? It's a huge issue. Uh, <clears throat> right. So conclusions, uh, Southeast Asia, you know, uh, this is kind of like you know, obvious conclusions, but the weaker parts of the area fall prey to invaders, either local or Western powers. So, you know, the kingdoms of Champa and Cambodia uh, fall, uh, fell prey to local invaders. Uh, Malay Peninsula, Java, uh, Sumatra, Spice Islands, uh, these fell prey to uh, Western powers. Um, and the stronger parts uh, managed to use trade to strengthen itself. So, you know, Thailand and uh, the kingdom of the Aceh, the Aceh Sultanate, managed to use trade to strengthen itself. Um, and, you know, this is the last period in world history where uh, if you so desire, you can still kind of ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. And so countries like Vietnam, Thailand, and Burma could afford to do this, right? Because they were strong enough to basically ignore you know, the impact that trade is having on the rest of the world and how, you know, the world itself is changing. By the time you get to the modern period from 1800 and after, this becomes impossible. No country can, uh, can escape the effects of trade. No country can uh, escape the effects of what other countries, other major powers, other great powers are doing in the rest of the world. 
Uh, but that is the modern period. Hence, it's the modern period. It's different from the early modern period, right? Um, so that's it for now, and I'll see you guys in the next video. All right. Take it easy.